Good evening. Welcome to the Ash Wednesday devotional service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Give us opportunity to worship you. Open our eyes and hearts and minds to you and your spirit to teach us and grow us for your kingdom's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. A moment while I share my screen, some of the words available to you. Let's join in singing together. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things have been, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. But it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. King of endless world. No one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things are. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It, but it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It's all about you. All about you, Jesus. First reading for this evening is taken from Joel, second chapter, beginning at the first verse. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. The day of the Lord is coming, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? 
Locust plagues common in the Old Testament days still devastate parts of the world today. This book was written in response to a devastating blight in Joel 1. Its text, however, is more than a historical record or lamentation. Joel used the local plague as a basis for developing a theology employed by other minor prophets of the day of the Lord that was coming, an event that would bring both judgment and salvation. The phrase as it appears in the book is versatile, applying alike to a locust plague, chapter one, an invading army in chapter two, the final battle of the last judgment in chapter three, and a salvation event, the outpouring of God's spirit. Chapter two, verse 28. Because of the coming day of the Lord, the prophet Joel calls the people to a community lament. The repentant community declares that God is gracious and asks God to spare the people, lest the nations doubt God powers, God's powers to save. The trumpet or the shofar I have back here on the altar, made of a ram's horn, was used to signal approaching danger, to sound an alarm. Blow the trumpet in Zion, the prophet says. Sound the alarm on, the, on my holy mountain. In the second chapter of Joel, the call is for the people of Israel to repent of their actions that are causing them to move further and further away from God. Getting in the way of God, fulfilling his plan of bringing a Messiah to the world through the people of Israel. God has to keep them in line. And in the Old Testament, plagues and other nations would often come to set them straight. Verses 12 to 17 is a call to repentance and prayer. Even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. Then in verse 15, it again says, blow the trumpet in Zion. But the, here the trumpet signals a call to religious assembly. The call for national prayer and fasting signaled an extraordinary event or calamity. This was a call to, to a community lament, and everyone was called to gather, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children and even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. The testimony of Israel was that their God was with them to protect, provide, direct, and save them. This passage ends, let them say, spare your people, O Lord. And do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? The question might be raised that if the people are suffering from plagues and armed forces that are coming, others might consider that they have no God at all, that God simply doesn't exist. But in our passage, it also says, return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I'll again, share my screen for the song.
This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I Second letter, second lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet maining, making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. One of my favorite passages begins this section. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Hebrew thinking and in writing, and Paul is a Hebrew in thought, there is always a, a, a parallelism in texts. This text says, for our sake, he made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, we who knew no righteousness, that's the piece you have to fill in, might become the righteousness of God. Elsewhere in Romans, Paul writes, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who has even has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. And then later in the chapter, Paul reaches his grand conclusion. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, Every one of us is in need of repentance, is in need of God's grace, is in need of forgiveness, in need of the cross. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes through a number of different laws and says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, and he makes every one of those laws harder than even the Pharisees and scribes have ever made them. 
And at the end of the chapter, he gets to this statement. You are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That passage ought to elicit a stunned gasp from us all. God is the standard. I'll never measure up. And that's exactly the point. We're all led to the point of seeking God in repentance. And the good news is that God places the righteousness of Jesus Christ upon us. When God looks at us, he sees us through the filter of the blood of Jesus as we are made righteous in him. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, we who knew no righteousness of our own might become the righteousness of God. Perfect as our heavenly father is. So at an acceptable time, I have listened to you and on a day of salvation, I have helped you see now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. The ministry of the gospel endures many challenges and hardships. Through this ministry, God's reconciling activity in the death of Christ reaches into the depths of our lives to bring us into a right relationship with God. In this way, God accepts us into the reality of divine salvation. Lent is the liturgical season for us to stop and reflect, to consider our need for the cross. Let's say.
Final reading for today is from Matthew 6, beginning at the first chapter. Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount, saying, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, Put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be, be seen not by others, but by your heavenly father who is in secret. And your father who is in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The imposition of ashes offers members of the body of Christ the opportunity for confession, a chance to offer themselves in the discipline and dedication of serving God through Jesus Christ. It is a symbol of a renewed commitment to prepare for the gift of Easter by living and experiencing the 40 days of Lent in prayer, in fasting, in repentance, in looking to the cross. This new relationship to the glory of Easter begins with a smudge of ashes on the forehead. Today we begin in repentance, a 40-day walk in anticipation and celebration of this gift of salvation through God's action in the resurrection. It's significant that this 40 day journey begins with a dirty face, the smudge of ashes on our forehead. Traditionally, the ashes come from the burning of the palm branches used the previous year to celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. With the imposition of ashes, we identify with the sin of the world, but we also confess our individual sin. The disposition of ashes provides us the understanding that Christianity is both private and public. Although we may wear them publicly for the day or evening, we are in personal privacy before God. If our mind isn't on God, but rather is concerned with what others may think about the smudge of ashes that is on our forehead, then we're not really worshiping in the way Jesus tells us in today's gospel lesson. That gospel message helps us to remember who we are as individual Christians and also collectively as the church, the body of Christ. Just as we don't pretend during Lent that Easter has not happened, neither do we pretend we live in a vacuum. The church is not a church in isolation from society. The church is carrying out its work as the body of Christ when it proclaims to the world the gospel of our Lord and Savior. Ash Wednesday and the season of Lent that follows provide perfect opportunity for us to reflect on our own individual need to confess our sin, to repent before God through Christ, knowing that before God, we can't imagine that we are sinless. If we understand that we are not sinless, then we must realize our need to confess our sin and to receive salvation as God's gift. 
in a real sense, accepting this smudge of ashes on our foreheads is our confession to God that our spirit is also darkness sin. The sign of the cross on our foreheads in ash at Ash Wednesday is also a reminder of the sign of the cross in oil in our foreheads at our baptism, marking us with the sign of Christ forever. Reminding us that we are God's beloved child. And we know the rest of the story. The price is paid. We are set free from the burden of sin and death. In repentance, we turn away from sin, but we also turn to follow, take part in the walk up to Jerusalem. And as we go, our gaze is drawn steadily and firmly to the cross of Christ. This evening, we begin our walk up the Judean hills, through the gates of Jerusalem, into the court of the high priest, to the palace of Pontius Pilate, and to the foot of the cross of Calvary. May your heart, your spirit, and your mind be renewed and strengthened for the journey. As with penitence, we seek the almighty and merciful God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. love in humble service for the weight of human need, who upon the cross forsaken work your mercies perfectly. We your servants bring the worship, not a voice alone but heart, consecrating to your purpose. Every gift which you impart. Still your children wander homeless. Still the hungry cry for bread. Still the captives long for freedom. Still in grief we mourn our dead. As you, Lord, in deep compassion, heal the sick and Spirit, send your power to our world to make it whole. As we worship, grant us vision till your love's revealing light. In its height and depth and greatness dawns upon our quickened sight. Making known the needs and burdens, your compassion bids us bear, stirring us to ardent service, your abundant life to share. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.